right. Thomas Strike asks, some of the instances I have are two or more service packs behind. Should I upgrade straight to the latest service pack, or do I do each service pack in order? Ooh, you can go straight to the latest service pack, and it's going to be, you know, get you all the way up to that point. The next thing that you want to ask is, what about cumulative updates? Because Microsoft is more and more encouraging us to go ahead and do cumulative updates as well as service packs. If you go to SQLServerUpdates.com, SQLServerUpdates.com is a site I built because lots of people have the same question. What updates should I apply and in which order? Right at the top of SQLServerUpdates.com, I tell you what service pack and what cumulative update you should apply in order. So based on whatever your SQL Server version is, you can go to SQLServerUpdates.com. Right at the top gives you a quick short answer. Mm-hmm. All right, let's see. Trying to find a good one here. <laughs> We're looking for, uh, we've got some, this one here. I like this one. It's about backups. So, uh -oh. Jeffrey Langdon says, we used to use Ola scripts for backups, but in the last year we switched to NetApp and Commvault and Pana, so we are now taking nightly full snaps instead of full backups with the scripts. Since we have several instances with 300 plus databases, it seems from a DR perspective to make sense to go with the snaps. Restoring all those databases from backs would be much more time consuming. What are your thoughts about traditional backups versus snaps? Let me guess, it depends. <laughs> yeah, well it's for me what it depends on is if I have more than a terabyte worth of data then I'm going to lean towards SAN snapshots or VMware snapshots. They're both wonderful, excellent. Now, I still have to get that data somewhere else. Anytime that it's just a snapshot, it's still inside the same storage device, and it's not really a backup until I get it off to tape um, or to Commvault, you know, these other types of devices. Um, but huge raving fan of stuff like snapshots. Unfortunately, you, you got kind of an, a trick question there. When you have dozens of databases, and generally the number seems to be about 20, when you have more than 20 databases, freezing the I.O. on each of those databases, because Windows does this serially in order, freezes the first database's I.O., then the second database, then the third database, this can take seconds, and in poorly configured situations, I've seen it take dozens of seconds. It freezes all of the I.O. on these databases while this is happening. So I want to be really careful about doing snaps when I have more than 20 databases on a single volume. So generally speaking, the places that I like snapshot backups a lot are for less than 20 databases that are more than a terabyte all on the same LUN. Then it's the snapshots are a wonderful way to get really fast backups and, as you noted, really fast restores. Huge fan of those. All right. I think this one is in regards to the uh, user database system database split question earlier. Justin asks, would you keep the tempdb logs with the tempdb data files? Well, yeah, that's a great question. I've always been fine with throwing them all on the same LUN. I've been really lucky and blessed in that I've never had a server that needed so much tempdb performance that it actually made sense to separate out tempdb onto its own LUN. Starting with SQL Server 2012, there's a service pack, and then also 2014 uh, RTM going forward, there's a huge improvement to TempDB where SQL Server will write less to the data files and the location of data versus log becomes even less important. If you search on our site, if you go to brentozar.com and hit the search up at the top, look for TempDB improvements. We've got a blog post explaining how it is, which version you need to be on, which service pack and cumulative update so that you get these uh, less eager write improvements. Um, and can make a huge difference in terms of performance. But it just means that now, starting with 2012 and even more so in 2014, it's just less important to worry about TempDB data versus log. Just throw yourself a drive full of uh, for TempDB. The next question that people end up inevitably asking is, how big should TempDB be? Well, because in our setup guideline, guidelines, for example, we tell you to start with either four or eight TempDB files. Let's say that we're going to start with four. My simple rule of thumb is you take whatever the drive is that you're allocating for TempDB, divide it by five. That's how large the TempDB data files need to be because that other one is going to be my log file. So just to keep the number simple, if I have 100 gigs worth of space that I'm going to use for TempDB, I'm going to have 20 gig data files and then a 20 gig log file. Four 20 gig data files and then one 20 gig log file. 
boom, there goes my drive, it's filled up to 100% and we are done. I have a great follow-up question for you on that separately. Oh, no. Uh oh. Uh huh. This is not from a question, but I think this is good with what you're saying. If you're okay. setting those temp DZ files, are you setting them to? Are you capping their growth, or are you allowing them to grow? I'll if I only have 100 gigs worth of space, I'm going to grow them all out and be done with it. If I have one drive that's used for lots of other stuff, you know, that's also user database files and temp DB data files. I've seen people argue both ways. I've seen people say, I want auto grow on so that uh, TempDB never runs out of space because bad things are going to happen when TempDB runs out of space. On the flip side, if TempDB fills up the whole drive, that also runs the user databases out of space. So just generally, it means you want to set up good alerting that as your drive, if it has to share with user databases, it's going to give you an alert as it starts to grow full. And then one of the best tips I ever heard uh, around this subject was from Dave Stein. Dave Stein was uh, made to mentor on Twitter. I forget what his new handle is now. But Dave said he would like to take a 10 or 20 gig backup file and leave it on every drive that he had so that whenever he got an alert that his drive was running out of space, he could just go delete that file and it would buy him some time as he went through and fixed the real problem. I'm like, oh, that's genius. I love that little trick. That's awesome. That's what you have to do when you cannot get more space. Yes, You have exactly. to be smarter than your sysadmin. Yes, <laughs> so sad. Yes. They're always in there. Can I delete these SQL Server data files? Doesn't look yeah. like they've been written to for three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah fine. log file. Who needs a log <laughs> file? <laughs> um, since we're on TempDB, Mandy Birch says, going back a couple questions, how can she put a TempDB on a local drive in a clustered environment. If she tries to add a file to her TempDB, she's not presented with any local drives as possible file locations. Is she missing something? My guess is you're not on SQL Server 2012 yet. 2012, this is something that was new and supported in the box in 2012. It was doable on 2008 R2 and prior, but not technically supported. And I want to say that there's some kind of uh, KB article for 2008 R2 where they kind of sort of support it now, but it involves some kind of backdoorsy trick. I would just say generally if it's important enough to you that you want to empty be on a local drive, that's a great time to also get onto SQL Server 2012. Only a consultant can say things like that, why don't you just upgrade to SQL Server 2012? But it's just one of those where I present it to management to say, hey, we would have this performance improvement when we go to 2012. This is just one of my long list of things that I want 2012 for can't wait to, you know, get onto that version. Uh, Mandy says she is on 2012 Standard Edition. So then it totally should work. Um, I'd be curious to see, I as soon as I say I'd be curious to see, then usually people are like, well, let me connect you into my server right now. No, I'm <laughs> not that curious. Um, but it totally <laughs> should work. It should totally show it to you. But make sure that it's only, it has to be on, uh, ooh, I wonder if there's an issue with, and I bet there is, I don't know this, but I wonder if there's an issue with mixed, uh, some of the files being on shared drives and some of the files being local. When you specifically said adding a file, that's an interesting perspective. I never uh, thought of that one, because usually with a ver cluster, I just set it up for the first time. What, the other thing you can do is, uh, script out adding a file and change the drive letters, do it manually, point it to the drive letter that you want it on, the drive letter and path. Do this in development staging or DR, not in production, because I don't want to see what happens to you if you add it, it fails over and it doesn't work right. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> I don't want to yeah. know what that would be either. I'm All curious, right. but, uh, I'm very curious to see your answer on this one, Brent. Uh -oh. Mark Hansen asks, or says, we have a table with a GUID as the key, and I'm told it's an ascending GUID. Is that true? If not, is there an easy way to change it? SQL 2008 R2. In theory, so there's this kind of GUID called a new sequential GUID. If you set up your GUIDs as new sequential GUIDs with the default value, in theory, SQL Server starts at one GUID and then progressively goes up, 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 and up. In theory, that's true. In practice, it's not whenever a cluster fails over, whenever you fail over from one node to another, the GUID's going to start in a different place and then start ascending again. Same thing if you fail over to disaster recovery or restore the database somewhere else or even just move it from production to development. 
So it's one of those where in theory it sounds pretty good, in practice it just doesn't seem to be quite the perfect panacea. Is there any reason why I would change it? No, it's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with it. There's a big religious war around should you cluster on GUIDs or not. What I usually tell people is, hey, hold on, let's step back and say, what's this SQL Server's biggest performance bottleneck? And let's focus on fixing that. Ain't nobody got time to fix everything in their SQL Server environment, and I want to make sure that you focus on things that users will actually get excited that you fixed, going, woo, we really noticed a performance difference. Changing between random GUIDs and sequential GUIDs, it's rarely the fix that make people go, oh, this is amazing, thank God, we can totally stop performance tuning now on this 486. You know, usually there's other issues. Yeah, all right, let's see. I'm not going to pronounce your name right. I'm sorry, but oh. Dijon, do I have to reinstall update after adding some features to SQL Server? Oh, that is a great question. I have no idea. Um, I've never thought about that before. I thought uh, you might like I, this one. Yeah, I would guess you do because in the installer, um, in the installer for the updates, it's got checkboxes for each thing that you want to patch, and like SSIS and reporting services are usually separate checkboxes. So my guess is that you would have to patch those again after the installation completes. All right, let's see. Um, Greg Knight asks, um, how many tables in a file group? More than 100 tables? more than 500 terabyte total. Do you cover this in a blog article or one of the classes? Oh, this is this is interesting because they're not really related. So breaking out objects into different file groups, it doesn't really matter how much data it is, how many indexes it is, how many tables it is, how many partitions. Really the big benefit for file groups is all around flexibility for restores. There's some different things that you can do around performance tuning with putting things on different storage as well. But the sheer quantity of tables doesn't matter at all. I, uh, SAP is a great example. You, you'll see a single SAP database with tens of thousands of tables in it. Uh, and they can throw the whole thing in one single file group and it's totally okay. We do actually cover this in our performance troubleshooting or performance tuning class. Our next uh, one happens to be in San Diego, beautiful sunny San Diego in February. So if you want to go uh, warm up somewhere and learn SQL Server, uh, you can learn more about those classes over at learnfrom.brentozar.com. Or if you go over to the top of brenozar.com and click training, we've got information about what's covered in the class as well as what fees are, when the next upcoming cities are. I want to say that we've got it in San Diego, Newark, Philadelphia, and Chicago in 2016. And I think they're on the screen rotating. Oh, probably true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right, let's see. In a new environment from Tim L, do you recommend simply going along with indexing and statistics recommendations from a third-party software like IDERA's Diagnostic Manager, or is there a deeper dive he needs to look to first? Ooh, so the, I'm going to give the kind of dodgy crap out answer on this. The first thing that I do is I don't want to make index changes unless users are unhappy. Because you probably have a lot of servers that you're dealing with, a lot of applications that you're dealing with. You can easily make things worse with indexing changes, like if you put too many indexes on a table. Idera SQL Diagnostic Manager, same thing with Dell Spotlight, uh, Redgate SQL Monitor, um, our uh, um, SQL Century Performance Advisor, and our own tool, SP Blitz Index all run off of SQL Server's built-in index instrumentation, aka the DMVs. The DMVs are not perfect. They will recommend near identical indexes to the ones you already have. You have to figure out which indexes are really close duplicates and then you don't really have to add and which ones are desperately needed that you do need. You can start with something like SQL DM or SP Blitz Index, but you're going to have to put some legwork in. If you go on our site over to brentozar.com slash blitzindex, brentozar.com slash blitzindex, 
we have this free, easy to use store procedure, SP Blitz index that Kendra Little wrote that helps interpret some of the indexes that you may need and some of the indexes that you may not need. It does take some time. It can take days to really dig into a database and make sense of it, but that's really the safest way to do it to make sure that you're not adding indexes that are near dupes of something you already have. All right, it looks like, let me make sure. I think this is a duplicate question. Yes, all right, so Monica Mindler asks, um, it's similar to the log shipping in HADR earlier. They are a data mart using 2008 R2 Enterprise, about to grow significantly in the scope of their data, currently experiencing some slow running queries, much of which could be addressed with query and index tuning. However, that's not in my hands. We're moving towards new hardware for HA and DR on SQL 2014, specifically a two node multi-instance failover cluster and log shipping. Right now we are in simple recovery. From what I know, I need to be in full recovery for those options. Can you talk a little bit about what, might, what that might do to our performance over the next two to four years, we expect to be somewhere between 12 to 14 terabytes of data. You know, it's really interesting. I, when, when you think about with SQL Server ba or, uh, recovery models, there's simple, there's full, and there's something else called bulk logged. But people often think that in simple mode, they have less overhead on the transaction log, and that in full recovery mode, then we have more detailed logging happening in the transaction log. You know what's goofy? turns out those are actually the same. Microsoft SQL Server writes the same amount of stuff in both instances. It's just that in simple recovery mode, the transaction log parts of it that were written to are marked as available for reuse as soon as those transactions finish. There should be a big ginormous asterisk over my head when I say that because there's things like replication that can influence that. But you're not adding more overhead just by throwing it into full recovery model, except that now you have to start taking transaction log backups in order to clear out to mark that of the area available for reuse. You have to take transaction log backups, which can slow down the database server. And people will say things like, well, I'm only going to do log backups once an hour because I'm worried about slowdowns. Well, what will end up happening is that on the hour when that log backup hits, well, wow, your database is really going to feel the pain as all of a sudden it slows down in order to clear that part out. If you search for, out on the Webernets, back up your transaction logs every minute, and then my name, Brent Ozar, I've got a post out there that explains why you should back up your logs every minute. Sounds like a ridiculous number. People hear this and go, oh my god, you can't possibly be serious. But if I just nibble away the parts of the transaction log that are getting used all throughout the hour, no one's going to notice that. It's more log backup files, and you do have to deal with that whenever it's time for recovery. But even if there's just 24 log backup files from once an hour, you're not really going to click through those manually, are you, in the GUI? It's going to take forever. Plus, you're going to have multiple databases. So if you search on that, uh, it explains some of the basics of why you want to set up transaction log backups every minute. I will say that at your size, between 5 and 15 terabytes, you really want to move towards SAN snapshot backups for your folds because that will back up the whole database in a matter of seconds um, and then let you turn around and present that backup over to your development environment, QA, to, log, to um, do DBCC against it. There's all kinds of really cool tricks that you can use. So really huge fan of snapshot backups at the size of database where you're at. But don't worry at all about switching to full backups. Just know that you're, wherever you're writing those transaction log backups to needs to be blazing fast. And that's time. Ta-da! Well, thanks everybody <laughs> for uh, joining us this week, and we will see you back next week at uh, Office Hours. Bye, everybody, and uh, see you next week. Bye.